Bible Mind, and we will be talking about prophets today from Ephesians 4. Let's go ahead and read the text, Ephesians 4, 11 through 14. It says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceit, uh, deceitful schemes. So we're moving into these last two are going to be a little more controversial. And I say that not because, I mean, the, the Word of God should never be controversial. But humans tend to make it that way, right? How many of you notice that people complicate things? We do. And, and sometimes I overcomplicate things, you know. And, and we have a simple gospel, and we have, we have a God who loves us, and yet we take the things that he gives us, and, and we make it complicated sometimes. So we're going to unpack this just a little bit. And I'll tell you the, the most important thing that uh, is going to guide our discussion today is Scripture. Okay, not, you know, what we've always believed or not what this uh, this teaching says or that teaching says, but what the, what the scripture say. And so we talked in week one in this series that uh, in a response to the latter rain movement uh, and, and the, the, the false teaching that came out of that movement, the Assemblies of God crafted a resolution in 1949 to uh, no longer recognize apostles and uh, modern-day apostles and prophets. And uh, so, but we also talked about that sometimes we have to use our five senses to see what God is doing, right? Uh, For example, some teach that the gifts of the Spirit are no longer in operation today, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, is no longer for the church today. If you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, they're going to have a hard time convincing you of that, right? <laughs> because you've witnessed it. You've seen it. You've, you've seen the effects. Uh, so I've been a part of the Assemblies of God Fellowship for uh, all of my 59 years. And uh, I can tell you with certainty that prophetic and apostolic ministry has been a part of the Assemblies of God since its inception. And there's been people that have been... Uh, identified as prophets like David Wilkerson and, and others that have, that have come along that have been recognized as such. And uh, so um, so through, though the Assemblies of God doesn't have like a, a credential level saying, okay, these are the, you know, when you get here, you're a prophet. You know, it's not like, like that kind of thing. Uh, we, we can be sure that, that a prophetic and apostolic ministry scripturally is part of our fellowship. Um, so what I'm seeing in, in our district from a district level and from a national level, though, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if sometime in the near future we don't even see a, a change in, in the language to the resolution. Uh, last year I was uh, invited to a um, school of the spirit is what they called it uh, with uh, Ronnie Morris and Rick DeVos. And, uh, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, teaching during that session, it was like a, a two-day session, was, was about uh, prophets and apostles and uh, the, the five-fold ministry. Um, and so there's many in our, our fellowship that, uh, that want to embrace the, full, the fullness of what Ephesians 4 talks about. And uh, in 2001, there was a position paper that was written. I don't know if anybody's uh, read or seen that position paper, but it was it was re- written and adopted uh, that it's on on apostles and prophets, and it's very good, uh, very good read. But in a lot of ways, the the language of the position paper supports the resolution, but with a caveat at the end, kind of leaving the door open, if you will. And so, uh, keep in mind that our district leaders and our National leaders are shepherds, right? And it's their job to protect us and to keep the wolves out, right? And we'll talk about this a little bit today, but in in these subjects, um, there are abuses. 
and there are wolves that are out there. And so anything I've said uh, about, you know, maybe uh, the Assemblies of God's decisions in certain things, I hold in, in very high respect because they're shepherding and they're protecting and they're trying to distance from the things that are out there that are false teaching and, and that are going in uh, very dangerous directions. So it's their contention that uh, in some circles, the effort to embrace Ephesians 4.11 is at the expense of Ephesians 4.12, okay? Which this is still up here, so you can see. The reason God gave these is to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ, not for ruling and reigning over the people, Okay? And so we'll unpack that just a little bit as we go. So let's start here. What is prophecy? Uh, prophecy is revelation, right? Uh, that means the, uh, a declaration of something that is not known. Uh, now this could be in the form of uh, bringing to light something that isn't already known. Um, for example, uh, when Nathan the prophet confronts David about his sin. You know, David, he thought he had gotten away with everything, right? And uh, Nathan said, you are that man, right? You remember without having to go into the story. So, so the prophet brought forth, the prophecy brought forth something that was hidden. Uh, we have some things that, that are not sin. For example, uh, Samuel the prophet, uh, Saul lost his donkeys. And if you want details on that, you can pick up a copy of Donkey Tales. <laughs> but... Uh, so, so Saul had lost his donkeys, and he was, he was looking for the donkeys, and he, you know, he, he didn't know that he was about to have an encounter that would have him declared as the next king. He meets Samuel, and Samuel says, he's coming in, Samuel says, hey, come have dinner with me. And, and it's like, well, i got something to ask you. He said, don't worry about the donkeys. They've already been found. Okay? So that was prophetic from Samuel to put Saul at ease so that he could embrace what God was to say to him. And so that was revealing something that was unknown, and, and God brought it to light. Uh, prophecy can be revelation uh, of future events. And, of course, you know we can read all the way through the, the Old Testament, see prophecies about the Messiah, uh, about Israel's coming captivity. Uh, Daniel prophesied about the four kingdoms to come, which came to pass. Uh, Joseph's interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams about the seven years of uh, good and seven years of famine. That would have been considered prophecy. And so uh, sometimes prophecy is uh, the telling of future events uh, for God's purposes. And so prophecy is God revealing information for the purpose of moving people into his will and toward his purpose. Okay? Not just so you can know stuff. All right? Not so that you can, hey, let me tell you a secret. Okay, God is always moving us along his will and, and, and toward his purposes. Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says, For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servant the prophets. So that's pretty cool. You know, um, parents, sometimes when they parent their kids, uh, they try to keep secrets, right? I remember Terry and I used to spell all the time. If, 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 we, if we didn't want our, our kids to know something, you know, we, we would spell it out, you know. And, and so one time we were in the grocery store, and I can't remember what the word was, maybe cookie or something, huh? McDonald's. McDonald's. And so, you know, we, we were spirit spelling, spelling things out, and uh, Shanda said, I can spell. <laughs> so, she was telling us, like, she knows what we're saying because uh, she can spell. And so... Uh, but but God God reveals His secrets and His mysteries to us because He wants us to be part of His plan. Amen. And He's He's not playing hide and seek, and He's not trying to uh, be so mysterious that that we can't ever find Him. Right? If you seek, you will find. If you knock, it'll be opened. And so God wants us to be part of His plan. And so He chooses people sometimes that are extra sensitive to hearing His voice and extra sensitive to uh, recognizing when He speaks and has the boldness to speak so that He can deliver His message to the people. Second Peter 1, 20 and 21 says, Knowing this, first of all, 
that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own ter- interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Spirit. And so we see that, that prophecy isn't, is never supposed to be, we'll put it that way, manufactured by man. It's, it's not intended to be, uh, well, we feel like this is what God's saying. You know, either God said it or he didn't, you know. And so, uh, so as uh, prophecy comes through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and, and prompts those that he chooses to speak in accordance with that. So what is a prophet? A prophet is one who hears what God is saying and has the boldness to speak on God's behalf. Uh, in Hebrew, the word prophet is navi, which is derived from the verb, verb nabu. I, I was asking, is it not working? It is if you might just get that far. Hmm? You said you made an error. Yeah. Oh, I did? <laughs> it did not on there? Okay, go back. It was supposed to be on there. So maybe I deleted it. I don't know. Anyway, so pretend I have the word navi up there. <laughs> and, and it was the Hebrew and everything. You, you would have took a picture of it, I promise. Uh, but uh, uh, I was asking Terry last night, I said, now in the movie Aladdin, uh, who was the character Nabu? Do you all remember Nabu? Nabu, the monkey. I think, yeah, it was the monkey. Yeah, that's what she told me. I was thinking it was the parrot, but then it's like, no, that was Iago, right? It was, it was the parrot. And so, uh, but anyway, Nabu actually means to declare or to announce. So I don't know what the monkey announced or declared, but, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, the Greek word is prophetes, and it's derived from a combination of two other Greek words, pro, which means before, and that before could either be uh, like earlier than or it could be in front of, like I'm, I'm pro the class right now, I'm before the class. Uh, and then the word feme, which means say. So you could take that as meaning standing in front to say, all right? And so that, that is uh, the, the word that's used for prophet. In a secular context, it meant that one that speaks for a deity. But, of course, in Christian context, it's a, sp- a spokesperson for God, someone that God has chosen to speak through. The prophet admonishes, warns, directs, encourages, intercedes, and counsels. And they bring the word of God to people of God to the people of God and call the people to respond. Uh, we have this slide up here already. So y'all, y'all got to look at it already. But the Old Testament is filled with prophets, right? Uh, we have 17 prophetic books. We have 12 major prophets and five minor prophets uh, books. And then we have just all these, all these prophets that are mentioned in the Bible. And then we have some instances that talk about a school of prophets or some interpretations say a company of prophets. So you have uh, Samuel is really the first one that we know of that had a school of prophets or a group of, of prophets that he was mentoring or, or over. Uh, and that's in 1 Samuel 19. We have 2 Kings 2, uh, when Elijah was about to be taken up. You know, there was a couple of different places where uh, the sons of the prophets came up in Bethel and in Jericho and by the Jordan. Uh, by the Jordan, there was a group of 50 of these sons of the prophets that had come up. Uh, 2 Kings 4, Elisha purifies a pot of stew for a group of prophets. 1 Kings 13, uh, there's a story about a, a man of God and an older prophet and the uh, interaction that they had. First Kings 18, Jezebel. Jezebel started killing all the prophets. And then you had this uh, guy in her court named Obadiah that hid 100 prophets, 50 per cave, and, and kept them safe and fed them. And matter of fact, he made sure he told Elijah about it when Elijah came back and said, hey, you know, I took care of the prophets. Okay, we, got, we still got 100, Elijah. Uh, so, uh, so we see in the Old Testament just you know a, a, a lot of prophets mentioned. In the New Testament, we have prophets as well. Acts 11:27 says, "Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over the world." Acts 13:1 it says, "Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers," and then it names uh, names these. Uh, 
uh, indicating that they were different from the group of prophets that had earlier come up from Jerusalem. Acts 15:32 it says, "And Judas and Silas." Were, uh, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. Acts 21.9 says, Philip had four daughters who were prophetesses. And so we see that in the New Testament there were even female, uh, female prophets. Uh, Acts 21.9, oh, that's what I just said. Um, in Paul's letters, he indicates the presence of prophets in the church churches that he had established. For example, uh, he provided instruction on their activities in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 14, 29 through 32, saying that their prophecies were to be tested by apostolic doctrine. And that's also uh, in uh, chapter 14, verse 37. Paul instructs men and women prophets in 1 Corinthians 11, 5 and 6. Uh, the Romans were to exercise the gift of prophecy in proportion to their faith. That's Romans 12, 6. And the Thessalonians were cautioned not to treat prophecies with contempt, 1 Thessalonians 5, 20. And Timothy had received a spiritual gift through prophecy with the laying on of hands. And that's 1 Timothy 4, 14. So we see a lot of prophetic work in the, in the New Testament uh, in, in that they were used. And so here's some of the ways that we, and some of the things that we get about prophets from the New Testament. Uh, first of all, there were recognized groups of prophets from the scriptures that we just read. Uh, the apostles sometimes functioned as prophets, uh, and you see those scriptures right there that uh, show that. And um, both men and women were recognized as prophets. Prophets did exercise spiritual influence, and prophets were never appointed to uh, ruling functions like overseers or elders, and they were not part of any kind of church leadership hierarchy. And the prophets stayed uh, true to the scriptures and apostolic doctrine. Okay, And so this is just kind of a background or, or a foundation, if you will, of uh, Old Testament and New Testament prophets and, and how they functioned and what they did. And so we're going to move to the question now then, are prophets for today? Are there modern prophets? Do we have that today? And so my counter question to that would be, why wouldn't there be? So for 4,000 years, God selected people that he could speak through. And for 4,000 years, he spoke in this way. So why then would he say, okay, now for the next 2,000 years, I'm not going to choose anybody to speak through. Okay, now we could... We'll, we'll talk about this in a minute, the caveat of the gift of prophecy, okay? Because as believers, we all have the ability to be moved on by the Holy Spirit in the gift of prophecy. We're talking about specifically about the prophet right now. Uh, the arguments against the existence of the modern-day prophets is very similar, and we've talked extensively about cessationists and the theology of uh, people that say the gifts of the Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and miracles and healings and all these things have ceased. And so, but, but when you look at their argumentation for, for cessation, the same type of reasoning is used for the cessation of prophets and apostles. Uh, so, for example, the, the first argument, uh, prophets are no longer needed because we have the completed Bible, therefore God has nothing more to say. Uh, really, usually the ones that use this argument are the same that say that you know the gifts of the Spirit are no longer in operation today. So they're saying, like, we're just, we're just throwing it all out. But think about it this way. When Moses, uh, God gave Moses the law, right? When God gave Moses the law, that was the word of God for them, right? So why were there any prophets after Moses if the law had already been given? If, if God had already said what he's going to say, why did he need Isaiah? Why did he need Elijah? Why did he need any of the other prophets? And uh, so we see, though, that when the law was given, the subsequent prophets, they didn't come along to add to the law or to change the law, but they came along to hold people accountable to the law that was already given. And that was their function. Nobody else came along and, and changed the law. Elijah didn't change the law. Isaiah didn't change the law. Ezekiel didn't change the law. Daniel didn't change the law. But they were prophets of God, God's voice to the people, to hold the people accountable to the law. Uh, God has completed his word, yes. We, we have the canonized scripture, and, and we believe 
that, that you know, God's not still writing the Third Testament, right? Because His Word, His Word is complete. But that doesn't, know, that doesn't mean that we don't still need revelation. Because revelation holds us accountable to the Word that God has spoken. So when I'm, when I'm talking about revelation, I'm not talking about new revelation. If, if anybody, oh, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Okay. I got to, I got to do this more. Uh, so really the, this type of argument saying that, well, you know, we have the canonized scripture, so therefore we don't need prophets anymore because God has nothing more to say is coming from a standpoint of not really understanding what the, what the uh, function of a prophet is. So the prophet isn't coming around uh, you know, making up new scripture, the prophet is holding us accountable to the scripture that's already given. Um, so not all the prophets had their word canonized, right? So when, when we looked at, at all the prophets on that list, uh, there's only 17 books, prophetic books, and only uh, Lamentations is by Jeremiah, so we can say, you know, we only have the words of 16 prophets. But yet there were hundreds, maybe, maybe even thousands of prophets in the Old Testament times. And so that's because not all prophets were given to speak in a, a can, you know, for, for the canonized scripture. Out of all of our New Testament scripture, how many of, how many of them are prophecy? Uno. Uno. <laughs> I mean, what is prophecy? It's revelation. What, what book do we have? Revelation. revelation. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, and so that would make John a prophet, right? Because he spoke prophetically. But yet there's a lot of other prophets named in the New Testament that their words are not given to us as canonical scripture because that's not the job of a prophet to utter I'll just say canonical scripture, okay? We'll just, we'll just say that because I think you know what I'm talking about. And so therefore, uh, just because someone's a prophet and speaking for God, you don't equate that with, oh, they spoke something, so we need to pay attention to that more than scripture. Oh, no. Oh, no. Because God spoke his word, and prophets speak to hold us accountable to the word that God has spoken. Well, let's go to this argument. In Ephesians 2. And this is used in, in a lot of different circles. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. It says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the, in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Okay, so this is really the main scripture that most people use to say that uh, apostles and prophets are no longer for today uh, because they say that the foundation was the apostles and prophets. And the ar argument is that uh, well, you can only have one foundation, so you can't have any more prophets because then that would that would mean that you're still trying to build the foundation. Anybody in here a builder? Am I the only one that's built? Okay, you built. <laughs> no, no builders in here. So, yeah. okay. So, in 2000 in 2008, uh, well, let's just say for from 1989 to uh, 2015, we lived in, in in a house in town. 26 years in the same house, and uh, we had 1,400 square feet and one bathroom, and four of us. And we raised our kids. And uh, when our when our kids uh, graduated high school and went to college, we decided to build onto the house because you know it was just the two of us, and we needed more space. <laughs> I don't know how you calculate that. But, uh, so we, we emptied out the back side of the house, and we actually tore off the whole back side of the house, and we moved into the front half, and we poured 600 square feet more to the, to the house so we could add on. If we were going to add on, was that necessary? Hmm? Yeah, yeah it, it was necessary, 
because else we would have just built the addition on the grass, right? And so we poured new foundation. It was, it was new foundation for the new part of the house, but we had to do something very carefully. We had to drill into the original foundation and, and place iron rods into the existing foundation so that when we poured the new foundation, it would, it would be strong and it would structurally be tied to the original foundation. Okay? For the house to grow, it needed more foundation, but it still needed to be attached or tethered to the original foundation to stay strong. So as, as the church began to grow, as the church began to spread, of course, God's gifts to the churches still needed to exist to give in these new areas and to give in these, these uh, expanded places outside of Palestine. God still needed to expand his foundation, but they had to stay attached to the original foundation. Okay? Or else it would break off and it, would, it could be destroyed. Okay? Uh, likewise, uh, if, if we were to build a high-rise building... And say in New York City, and I have no experience of this, okay? But I do know that they pour a massive foundation. And sometimes they go hundreds of feet in the ground, I guess, uh, way down. I mean, they, they pillars, and I mean, they make it very strong. So it's, it's a strong foundation. And they build floor one, right? When they get ready to build floor two, they don't redo the original foundation, but they have to have structure for that second floor that will support the second floor. Okay? So it's not a replacement for the original foundation, but it is foundational to the next level. And so as time goes on, each generation needs foundation for that generation to be able to, to be stable and be able to grow on, be able to stand on, it doesn't replace the original foundation, but it's still foundational, right? And so therefore, you need, you, you need continued foundation to grow the church and to grow, uh, grow what, what God is doing so that it can always be stable, so that it can always be solid. Um, and then Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 2. It says, Long ago... In many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And so some, uh, some will use this argument saying that, you know, after Jesus, there was no need for prophets anymore because Jesus was the last prophet. All right, well... We already know then that, you know, all the prophets that we've already mentioned that were New Testament prophets would have been false prophets because they came after Jesus. Uh, the, the Old Testament prophets mentioned in this verse were, uh, uh, prophets of the Mosaic law and the, the law and the prophets prepared the way for Jesus to come. Jesus is the word, right? According to John 1 1, Jesus is the word and he is God. And so the prophets that come along after him are speaking the words of Christ, actually speaking Christ to the world. And so uh, that's the only three, and I, I, tried, to, I tried to research, okay, what, are the, what are the arguments out there against modern-day prophets? And that's the only three that I could find. There's no scripture that says that, that they cease. And so I'm just going on scripture, okay? I'm not I'm not trying to make an argument from uh you know from uh any position or any standpoint from any group of people here or there. I'm just saying scripturally, just like there's no scripture that says that the gifts of the spirit have ceased, and you can use uh you know first Corinthians chapter thirteen all you want, but that scripture isn't talking about the gifts of the spirit ceasing, neither is there a scripture that says that these gifts that Jesus gave the church, these five gifts, it doesn't say, well, Jesus gave five gifts, but then he took two back. Okay? What is the difference between a prophet then and one used in the gift of prophecy? Uh, the gift of prophecy, first of all, it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
All right. First Corinthians 12 through 14, the, the, the chapter is 12 through 14. By the way, most of you know this already, but we call chapter 13 what? First Corinthians 13? The love chapter. We just got through Valentine's Day, right? And so probably people were quoting the love chapter. You know, honey, you ain't bearing all things. <laughs> but um, 1 Corinthians 13 is part of the teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, so uh, 12 through 13, I mean 12 through 14 declares that any believer can prophesy. And as a matter of fact, Paul says that we should seek to prophesy. Uh, this this should be something that w- that we desire to be used in this in this gift of prophecy, um, and so we also find further that it is for the uh, edification, for the exhortation and comfort of other believers. Okay, so that's the gift of prophecy. The office of the prophet is a little different. An Ephesians four prophet is a calling. It's one whom Jesus has selected to have uh, their ear always listening. Uh, to what he is saying, and a mouth that's bold enough to speak the message to the church. Uh, the prophet is an interpreter of divine truth. Uh, they reveal the mind and the heart of God through word and deed. And we can define uh, the prophetic ministry as connecting people to the presence of God so they see, he, uh, see hear, and feel him for themselves. Uh, a called prophet must have... Uh, Great faith to be able to speak the word of God with boldness and confidence. In Romans 12:6, it says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith. And so to be able to speak on a regular basis on behalf of God, you have to have, you have, to have faith and you have to have confidence in hearing the voice of God and the boldness to speak that out. Um, the purpose of the prophet is to build up the body of Christ and to equip the saints for the work of ministry, right? I mean, that we want to look at the, the, the offices, if you will, and I've already told you I kind of loosely hold on to that term, but the, the offices are of the purpose to equip the body, uh, the, uh, to build up the body and to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so we have to look at it in that light. So for building up the body of Christ, the prophet ensures we remain connected to God in our worship and our lifestyle. A prophet has greater sensibility to what is happening in the spirit and will often carry a sense of what God is doing or wanting to do in the current seasons. And uh, they will have heightened awareness to spiritual warfare and can warn the church of coming attacks. Uh, They'll challenge anything that shows spiritual backsliding, drifting, or stagnancy, whether that is individual or corporately. And so that's how they operate in the body to to help build up the body, to build up believers in Christ individually. But then to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, a prophet will disciple others and help them grow in hearing the voice of God for themselves and others. Prophets generate and develop an atmosphere that lends itself to spiritual encounters and expectancy that is tangible when the church gathers. And so these are, these are ways that the prophet helps others be equipped to go out and to fulfill the ministry that has been given to them. So what is the role of the prophet as it relates to the, the pastor, the apostle, the teacher, and the evangelist? Well, the prophet partners with the apostle by revealing the heart of heaven in the, in the uh, midst of God's mission. A prophet equips the evangelist with clear vision of what God is saying and provides tension between uh, God's holiness and God's love. What I mean by tension is uh, a, a prophet seems to always have this, this just, I mean, a drive for holiness. Because they hear the they hear the heart of God and they know God is holy and, and they want people to be holy. The evangelist is driven by God's love, right? I mean, God loves you and He wants you to be saved, you know. <laughs> and so that that's the heart of the evangelist. And it's both, right? It, it's both it's both God's holiness and God's love. And so the relationship between the prophet and the evangelist is is kind of that tension between God's holiness and God's love, so that the the prophet can go out. And, and help the evangelist understand God's holiness, and the evangelist can remind the prophet, oh yeah, but God is still love. You know, and so we have to go out and we have to, to uh, get the people. Uh, a prophet partners with pastors by shining a light on what is hidden, whether it 
maybe sin in the camp or identifying seasons and paths for the church. And the prophet is a vessel through whom God reveals truth. Uh, the, the, the teacher is gifted in bringing clarity to revelation through Scripture. And so the, remember, the teacher is always concerned about tying things to Scripture and to, to bring into light Scripture. All right? So uh, let's talk about what authority does a prophet have, because this is, this is a big deal in, in the debate in Christendom right now. Uh, as those that believe in modern-day prophets, what role of authority do they have? First of all, because of the nature of what the prophet is doing, speaking for God, there is authority in that, okay? But remember that we, we talked about how when, when the prophet speaks, then the people decide what to do with that, right? Uh, the Ephesians 4 prophet uh, does not have any kind of absolute power over the church. And uh, we'll talk about an organization here in a little bit that, that believes that, oh, when the, when the prophet speaks, you don't question that. You just have to do it. And that's not scriptural. Uh, the prophet is a conduit of what God is saying to the church. Uh, the authority that they have is to be taken seriously when they speak what God has given to them. Uh, the prophet is communicative, though not administrative. Uh, he or she reveals God's message, but they're not the ones that, that drive the, the carrying out of, of that message and, and how that's enforced. Uh, when a prophet speaks, the church or the elders are to judge that word and, and to discern whether that, that word is from God. You know, Paul talks about that extensively in, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, talking about when, when the, the prophecy goes forth, the, the, the elders or the church has to judge that word and make sure that it is God speaking. Um, and that, that's just smart checks and balances, right? Because, you know, it keeps you from just, you know, like taking what somebody says and just running with it uh, because you can be led astray that way. Acts 11, 27 through 29 it says, Now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over the world. Uh, this took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, and then they figured out what they were going to do. And so uh, the, the point of that is the prophet spoke in a foretelling way. He, he told of a coming famine. And, and so the disciples, or the, the, the church in Antioch, they examined that word, and when the Holy Spirit gave them confirmation of that, they, they determined what to do, or they discerned what to do in that situation, which was, hey, let's get a bunch of stuff together and let's take it to them. Um, so you don't see Agabus actually dictating what they were supposed to do. In Acts 21, 10 through 14, <clears throat> uh, it says, While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, uh, th Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is what the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, uh, we and the people there urged him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, sweet, uh, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be in prison, but to even die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and uh, said, let the will of the Lord be done. Paul had already, and if you remember, those of you who go back to our series on Paul, Paul had already uh, determined that the Lord was going to have him arrested when he got to Jerusalem. He already knew that, right? And so he was just going on minding his own business. And so uh, Agabus comes and he sees this in the Spirit. He sees the Holy Spirit revealed to him as a prophet what's about to happen. So he puts on this display about, you know, uh, whoever, you know, whoever I'm, you know, he took Paul's belt and bound himself with it and said, you know, whoever's belt this is, is going to be belt bound when they get to Jerusalem. And so they all interpreted that of, well, that means, Paul, you're not supposed to go. And Paul's like, you know, Guys, I get it. You're trying to, you're trying to, you know, keep me safe. I have to go. The Holy Spirit has already constrained me to go. And so, Agabus didn't reveal what the Lord said and then dictate, Paul, this, this is what it means to you. He gave the, the inter he gave the, the prophecy of what the Lord was saying, and then they determined what actions to take from that. John's letter to the seven churches was. Um, 
a revelation straight from Jesus himself, right? When, when he had the vision and Jesus said, hey, write this to these, these seven churches. And so this, this was prophecy to these churches. Uh, most of it was, hey, here's what you're doing good, but here's what you're still not doing right. And these letters went out to the churches. John never followed that back up and went to the seven churches and said, okay, let me give you instruction on how to follow that out. John's prophetic word went forth, and then the churches and the elders had to implement that word when it got to them. Um, if a prophet has been established as a reliable voice of God, there is a lot of authority that goes with that word, yet the prophet doesn't administrate the application of the word, nor does the prophet sit in an exalted seat over the church. They're a gift to the church. Okay? And so that's, that's the proper authority of a prophet to deliver the word of God, and then that word is judged, and then, then the church moves forward to that. Uh, it, you know, it, and if, if it is determined that it is a word from the Lord, then you're accountable for that, right? Well, let's talk about this. There's a movement now called the New Apostolic Reformation. Okay, and I don't know if you've heard of that. Some, some call it NAR. Uh, they don't call themselves that, okay? That's just, you know, when, because it's not a denomination. It's not an official group with a headquarters or anything like that, okay? It's just, uh, uh, there's a lot of charismatic churches that fall under, uh, this, this teaching. And there's a, and I started to have some names for you, but I decided it's not about names. So, so I'm just gonna leave names out of it. But we have to watch out for things like this. It, it, um, goes back a lot to, uh, the same teachings of the latter rain movement of 1948 and greater and the things that they believed. And uh, so this is uh, th- this organization, uh, they believe a lot in, in authority and uh, that, that uh, God is raising up in these days prophets and apostles who are given authority over the church. And the, uh, this authority is absolute and cannot be questioned. Uh, if you're named an apostle or a prophet for, for in, this, in this movement, then what you say is not questioned, is not judged. If, if you speak it, you're speaking for God, and, and it has to be followed. Uh, they believe in new revelation coming through the prophets and apostles, and uh, these new revelations will help the church overcome the world. And when they're talking about overcoming the world, uh, they uh, don't believe in just uh, spiritually overcoming the world. They believe that the church is supposed to rise up and uh, like have authority over the earth, uh, and and we're supposed to you know like you know be in places in the government, and, and you know the church is actually supposed to rise up and rule the earth, and uh, this is going to happen through like the apostles and the prophets in, in the fivefold. Okay, um, here's a quote from one of them. I said I wasn't going to uh, use any names, but I mean I'm, I'm going to do a quote. I have to give the name. His name is Peter Wagner. Uh, it's one of the movement's leaders. says, when Jesus came, he brought the kingdom of God, and he expects his kingdom-minded people to take whatever action is needed to push back the long-standing kingdom of Satan and bring uh, the peace and prosperity of his kingdom here on earth. And so they've taken it on themselves that you know, we're, we're supposed to rise up and we're supposed to rule the earth as, as the church. Um, and so, um, this is not what the kingdom of God is about, though, right? Uh, false teaching like this is, uh, uh, in, in things that come out of the, this movement, is what makes others run from the fivefold, the prophets, the, the apostles. They, they run from this because of the abuse. Because they're afraid, hey, you know, if you call yourself a prophet, then you may be one of these. And so, you know, and, and it makes people run the other way. But what we need to do is, is not run from the truth just because some have abused the truth. We need to find proper scriptural basis and pro- proper scriptural truth and embrace the truth. Uh, you know, the old saying, and, and I, this is a dumb saying, but I'm going to use it anyway. Uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now, who would do that? <laughs> uh, but but we, we have to embrace Scripture, but we don't have to embrace, uh, embrace the abuses of the Scripture. You follow what I'm saying? Okay? So this leads us then to talk about what is a false prophet. We're doing pretty good, actually. So thank you all for being attentive today. I know we're usually more interactive, 
But I usually have uh, seven to eight pages of notes to deliver to you, and that gives us more space to breathe. I had 15 today. <laughs> okay. so, so I'm trying to move through this. I'm, I'm hoping you're getting something out of it. But thank you for being so great. False prophets. Matthew 7, 15 through 16 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by what? By their fruit. What's the fruit, fruit of a prophet? What's that? It comes to pass, right? Okay, it comes to pass. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, let, let me give you a hint. What's the fruit of an Ephesians 4.11 prophet? To build up. Okay, to build up the body and equip the saints of ministry. Okay, that, that's the fruit of an Ephesians 4 prophet. Okay, if, if that fruit isn't there, then... It may be that they're self-seeking, or it may be that they have another agenda. Jesus didn't. Uh, this is this is a, a side note, but de- Jesus didn't warn, saying, "Be be uh, cautious of any." I mean, not be cautious. It said, uh, "You know, stay away from anybody that says they're a prophet, because there's no more prophets." Not what he said. He said, "Watch out for false prophets." So if you have to watch out for false prophets. That means you have to discern between a true prophet and a false prophet, right? Okay? And so if, if the false prophet is to be truly disguised, then they have to look like the real thing sometimes, right? And so let's look what Peter has to say about that. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3 says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false, prof- uh, false teachers among you who will secretly bring uh, in destructive heresies, even denying the master who taught them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their uh, sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago uh, is not idle, and their destruction is not a, uh, their Destruction is not asleep. And so uh, a prophet's words must always be measured against Scripture, right? Because remember, we're not looking for new revelation, but a prophet holds us accountable to, to the revelation that's already been given. And so, uh, and, and just to say this too, I'm not, I'm not afraid of the term new revelation, okay? As long as it's a revelation of clarity of Scripture, not changing what Scripture says, okay? And, uh, I, and this is a side note. I probably should even cut this out of the video, but I did have my conversation uh, that I was telling you about with my Jehovah's Witness friend, and, and we started talking about the, the Trinity and the, the uh, uh, deity of Christ. And uh, so he said, well, you know, where did, the, where did the doctrine of the Trinity start? And I said, Genesis 1. <laughs> you know, And so... It, to him, he doesn't see that in Scripture. So if I give him new revelation about Genesis 1, it's not a new revelation. You understand what I'm saying? It's new to him because he doesn't have understanding. Okay? And so that's why I'm not afraid of the term new revelation. But if your new revelation doesn't line up with Scripture, uh-uh. It's going in the refuse bin. Okay? <laughs> What's that? Exactly. Exactly. Okay? Um, so if you hear somebody announce that they have a new word from the Lord, and, and actually uh, I remember seeing a Facebook post by uh, a, a preacher um, that I knew of. I didn't really follow this preacher. But uh, he said, you know, come to my church tomorrow. I have a word from the Lord, and you've never heard this before. I was like, red flag. <laughs> you know, because if I've never heard it before, it's probably not in the Bible because I've read the Bible. <laughs> and so... Uh, so we have to run from those things that, that, that are apart from Scripture because God's not going to contradict His Word. God's not going to... Yes, sir? Uh, what about a, a revelation that, that can't be denied by Scripture? That can't be denied by Scripture. Uh, I don't believe that there's... Uh, a, I'll say if, if there's something that we believe that's not in Scripture whatsoever, I'm going to be very cautious about that. Because 
God, uh, and I believe that, you know, some people tell me, well, how do you know the Word of God is true? Or how, what about, you know, the book of the Maccabees and the Apocryphal books? And what about, here, my answer to that is God is sovereign. And God has given us the words that he wants us to follow. He's protected that. He's, he's fostered that word throughout time. Okay? I'm only held accountable to this. All right? And so if that new word, if that new word can be supported in Scripture, then I can support that word. If that new word is outside of Scripture and it's not uh, expli- explicitly condemned by Scripture... I'm still going to be cautious of it, okay? Because sometimes Scripture can bear something out in principle without it being explicitly said. You see what I'm saying? But it still has to line up with, with God's character. It has to line up with God's words in totality. That's not the word I meant to say. Yeah, totality. Thank you. <laughs> not totalitarian. That's, <laughs> that's the wrong one. Uh, but that, that kind of uh, goes back to my conversation with uh, my friend this week. Is, uh, and he had never heard the word, and I've, I've used it in here. You've heard me say the word preponderance, right? I, I believe in the preponderance of Scripture. Uh, and, and that's kind of a legal term. You know, when, when a, a, a prosecutor is trying to get a conviction, he, he lays out, you know, your guilt from the preponderance of the evidence. Okay, so that, like, you put it all together and this is what it means. And so that's why we have to look at things theologically from the preponderance of Scripture, meaning I'm not going to build my theology on one Scripture or the absence of Scripture. I'm going to build theology on the, the preponderance of God's Word from, from cover to cover. What, is, what does God's Word say in total? And then we can get a sense as to does this Word that was given fit in, in the preponderance of Scripture? Is it, does it carry weight in what, what the Bible says? that answer your question? Okay. Uh, Ephesians 5.11 says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. And so this even says not to just sit idly by, right? Not to just say, oh, that don't sound quite right, but I'll just keep my mouth shut. Okay? Okay. Uh, and I'll, I'll give, I'll have a conversation with you, and I know we're, you know, uh, we got four minutes this morning, but if there's anything in this today that you have questions about, let's have a conversation. Just say, hey, can we get together? And I'll, I'll be glad to sit down. Because, you know, if I've, if I've spouted heresy and you don't say anything, you're not following this, right? And so, so we're supposed to call out those things. Uh, one reason that we need true prophets and teachers, though, is to ground us in the Word so that when you hear false prophecy, when you hear false teaching, you know that it's false because you know what the truth is. And that's why it's, it's needed today. Whew, we got three minutes and we got a long way to go. Will you give me like five extra minutes? Okay. All right. So here we go. Is, the, is a prophet infallible? Okay, uh, and I heard a scripture over here that, that we're going to talk about. Uh, this is a point that a lot of people, I think, have improper understanding about, that, uh, you know, a prophet, you know, a prophet can only be a prophet if they're, they're 100% accurate all of the time. Anybody in here 100% accurate about anything all the time? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to raise my hand. <laughs> I'm 100%. Uh, but, you know, we, we're human, right? And so when, when God spoke, by the way, when God speaks, it's always true and accurate. Okay, let's be clear about that. But the argument is made that uh, Deuteronomy, well, you know, Deuteronomy 18 says that a prophet, if a prophet gets it wrong, kill him. You know? <laughs> well, we wouldn't have anybody prophesying, would we? But let's read that. Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 22 says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, <clears throat> or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, uh, how may we know the word of the Lord uh, has not spoken, when a, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if that word does not come to pass or come true, that word is, 
That is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. He need not, you need not be afraid of him. Okay, I know that was a, a mouthful there. Let's look at that word uh, presumptuously. It's the word bezadon. Hey, I got that one on there. <laughs> the word bezadon, it, it means arrogance, arrogant uh, insolence, or insolent pride. So what the, the passage in Deuteronomy is talking about is not somebody that, that is trying to interpret the word of the Lord and, and misspeaks or, or says, it, says it wrong or whatever and then tries to go back and correct. It's not talking about that. It's talking about this person is saying they're speaking for the Lord, but they're in rebellion to what God is really saying. And they're leading the people astray. As a matter of fact, uh, First Corinthians, I mean Deuteronomy 18 dovetails Deuteronomy 13 that has already said that, that uh, uh, talking about um, um, the the prophet that's worthy of death is one who willingly leads the people astray. And so we see a picture of of prophets or people coming in willingly trying to take people in a direction maybe for their own gain maybe for their own power maybe for their own own devices or they you know they want to be the cool person in the club or whatever the, the fact is but they're not speaking for God they're speaking for their own edification or glorification then that person is in rebellion to God and that's that's what uh, these Deuteronomy passages passages are um um denoting or explaining. Um, worth noting, though, that not a single prophet in the Old Testament was put to death for getting anything wrong. And there's lots of them. Okay? As a matter of fact, more often, the prophet who was the true prophet was the one that got stoned or killed in some way, right? You remember Jeremiah, uh, when, when the people had gone into captivity, all of Jeremiah's contemporary prophets were saying, hey, y'all don't worry about it. The Lord has said in two years we'll be back in our land. And Jeremiah was like, that's not what the Lord said. The Lord says, settle in, marry a wife, get some land. You're going to be here for 70 years. They threw Jeremiah in a well and put a lid on it <laughs> because he wasn't getting in line with what all the prophets were saying. Okay, And so we, we see that, that these weren't actually put into, into practice. Uh, not all prophets even... Um, had everything that they said had come to pass. Samuel is one who did. All right. Uh, if we look at 1 Samuel 3, 19 through 20, it says, and Samuel grew. This is right after, you know, this, when Samuel first heard from the Lord and, and uttered his first prophecy to Eli. It said, and Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as the prophet of the Lord. And so Samuel was a prophet who got it right 100% of the time. That's what that means. None of, none of his words fell to the ground. Okay? You could use the reverse of that to say there were some prophets that maybe some of their words fell to the ground. Okay? But, but Samuel was exalted because he was, he was accurate uh, with what the Lord said all of the time. Uh, David's go-to prophet was Nathan, right? And so in 2 Samuel 2, uh, 7, 2 through 5, it says, Now when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest on, uh, from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord. And then he goes on to say, you're not the one that's going to build me uh, a uh, house that's going to be your son, David. Now, some will say, well, Nathan didn't get it wrong because he wasn't really speaking for the Lord uh, the first time he said. He was just, you know, like saying, okay, well, you know, uh, I, think, I think you should, you know, whatever. But keep in mind, Nathan's position was to tell David, to advise David on the word of the Lord every time he was asked by the king. And so when David said, hey, Nathan, here's what I'm thinking. What do you think? Nathan was responsible for giving him the word of the Lord the first time. And it didn't say Nathan said, okay, let me go pray about it or let me, let me seek the Lord. Nathan just, Nathan just spoke. When the prophet speaks, he was speaking for the Lord. And so, uh, so uh, Nathan got it wrong, but he went back, you know, when the Lord spoke it to him, he went back and corrected it. It's like, look, you know, 
I misspoke. I, I, you know, I said it wrong, but here's what the Lord really said. Um, Jonah also is considered a prophet, but Jonah's only prophecy that we know of didn't, didn't come to pass, right? You know what I'm talking about? Jonah, Jonah was told to go prophesy to Nineveh saying, you're going to be destroyed in 40 days, right? So he didn't at first, but he finally did go and he gave the prophecy and what happened? They repented and God relented from the destruction and it didn't happen. And and Jonah got mad about it. Right. That's why he did, because he didn't want them. He wanted them to be destroyed. He didn't want them to, to be saved. Uh, and but um, let me see if I have one more. Yeah, let me tell you this one more example, and then I'll make my statement. But Isaiah came in and uh, told Hezekiah. He said, "The Lord says, get your house in order. You're about to die." Did that come to pass? No. Because Hezekiah turned to the wall, cried like a baby. <laughs> and God said, okay, I'll give you 15 more years. But that didn't make Isaiah a false prophet. Okay? Listen to this. Prophecy often is conditional. Because God is always trying to move us into his will and along with his purposes, right? That's why we have scriptures like, if my people, right? You read through the prophecies of the Old Testament, and and most of them are, if you do this, I'll do this, right? So prophecy is often conditional and and not, uh, not, you know, hey, if this don't come to pass like this, then you're a false prophet. Um. Agabus in Acts 21, uh, how are we doing on time? Terrible. Thank you for asking. Uh, Agabus in Acts 21 told Paul uh, with demonstration that he was going to be bound by the Jews and turned over to the Gentiles. That's not the way that it happened. Actually, when Paul went, was in the temple, the Jews drug him out and started beating him, and the Romans came in and, and arrested Paul, saving his life. So he was still captured, but it didn't happen the way that Agabus said, okay? Uh, so that's just saying that, that sometimes prophecy, uh, even, even in the, the, the ears of the prophet, the, the prophet has to discern what that is, okay? Uh, let me see where I am. I may want to jump down. Okay, go ahead to that next slide. Okay, so you've seen this before, some of you that's been in the class for a while. But this is kind of a graphical representation of what, you know, God downloads, whether in a vision or whether in word or dream or something like that, God downloads his, his word or his, what he wants spoken into the prophet or that even, this applies even to the gift of prophecy. God brings that in. We have to, in our, in our head, process that so that we can say this is what the Lord says, Right? And someone who is a gifted prophet will be more likely to get this right than if you're being used in the gift of prophecy for the first time. And, and you're like, wow, what just happened? Hannah, you've prophesied before from the platform. And sometimes it's, it's you know, you, you feel that coming into you and you're like, okay, how do I word this? You know, I, I feel the heart of God. I know what God is saying, but somehow I've got to get this out of my mouth, you know, and, and uh, sometimes I stand up, I'm not saying I'm a prophet, but sometimes I stand up here and I know what the Lord's told me to tell you. And sometimes I walk away from here saying, well, I butchered that, <laughs> you know. And, and sometimes we do because we're, we're human and, and we're trying to uh, take a finite being and connect it to an infinite God and, and somehow speak that out. And, and we're just human. God understands that, okay? And, and God, God works through our humanity and he works through our imperfections. And to, to continue to move us along. Uh, one thing that we can be confident about, confident about, is that God will give you discernment to glean from prophecy exactly what you need to know. And so don't be intimidated by the fact that, you know, if you feel like God's used you in the gift of prophecy, or even uh, if a prophet speaks something and, and you feel like, you know, that just didn't come out right, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that causes the prophet to speak, 
can, can be the Holy Spirit in your ears, taking what you've heard and say, okay, let me, let me interpret that for you, okay? <laughs> they, they, they weren't exactly, you know, so. Uh, but God will make sure that you get his word into you. Uh, while I believe that these are, uh, there are those that are called into prophetic ministry still today, Paul makes it clear that um, every spirit-filled believer can prophesy, and you should earnestly seek the gift of prophecy. And uh, I had mentioned before the, this position paper that the Assemblies of God has, has written, and so I want to do a quote from that, um, that paper. I might even link that for you in our uh, Facebook group if you wanted to read it. But it says, There is no statute of limitations on the spirit of prophecy. In the words of Peter's prophetic sermon, the promise is for you and for your children and for all those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So I believe that the spirit of prophecy is alive today and that uh, the, the one who God calls to prophesy is alive and well as well. But we must be discerning. When it, whenever God, whatever God designs is good, but the devil's always going to want to try to pervert that and try to copy and try to uh, cause division and cause confusion over what God does, right? Uh, and so, you know, we, ha- we must be wise and we must be discerning and we must lean on Scripture so that we can let the Holy Spirit guide us in, in the, the things that God is speaking, right? Right? 